If you haven't already noticed, Taylor Swift is absolutely everywhere for a few different reasons. For her new albums, her re-released albums, her Eras Tour, her Eras Tour movie, and of course her budding relationship with Travis Kelsey, which absolutely everyone is obsessed with. Although all of these things have just added to more reasons why she's in the spotlight because she's pretty much been a constant figure in the news since she released the news about her Eras Tour. If you don't know what that is, this is Taylor Swift's first concert since 2018 when she did the reputation tour and this concert spans the course of her like 17 years of music and all of her albums she's created up until this point and it goes through each era or album this is where the in her blank era trend comes from which i'm sure you've seen across all social media platforms now i'm sure you've already seen how expensive these tickets are how expensive the resale of these tickets are and even how hard they are to come by to begin with. And not only the amount of money Taylor herself has made from these concerts, but how much she's boosted the local economies of the places she plays in. Now, this tour has been so successful that she decided to come out with the Eras Tour movie, which is a recording of one of her concerts from SoFi Stadium in California. Now, if you haven't seen this already, I would 100% recommend going to see it. It was absolutely amazing. I can't even imagine what it would have been like in person. That must have been just like electric, but the movie was so good. It's not just a concert. It's literally like an entire performance. I'm not going to spoil it for anyone, but it was so amazing. She really put on such a show. Now, although there's literally so much to talk about, about the Eras tour and how much of a smart business decision it was, we're going to be talking about why Taylor came out with Taylor's version of her older albums and what repercussions that's going to have for the future of the music industry. But first, we're going to give a little more context to the matter. Hey everyone, welcome to Painting in the Past, a series where I paint something and talk about the past. Now, since everyone loved the last video I did about Taylor Swift and Rebecca Harkness and her Rhode Island house, and music is a form of art, so today we're going to be doing another Taylor Swift themed video and I'm so excited for this one because I just find this so interesting. So let's start at the beginning. In 2005 when Taylor Swift was 15 years old she signed a 13 year record deal with Big Machine Records owned by music executive Scott Burchetta. This deal gave Big Machine Records ownership over Taylor's master recordings. So in other words they owned the rights to the original recordings or performance of those songs. In 2006, Taylor released her first single, Tim McGraw, which absolutely exploded her career. Then under Big Machine Records, she would release the following six albums. Taylor Swift in 2006, Fearless in 2008, Speak Now in 2010, Red in 2012, 1989 in 2014, and Reputation in 2017. Keep in mind her record deal with Big Machine Records does not end until 2018. In 2009, Kanye West notoriously grabbed the mic out of a 19 year old Taylor Swift's hands at the MTV VMA's acceptance speech and declared that Beyonce should have won instead of her. Now, although Taylor and Kanye appeared to kind of mend their differences, this issue would come back up when Kanye West would make very sexual references towards Taylor Swift in one of his music videos. In his 2016 track, Famous, he said, I feel like me and Taylor might still have sex. And he said, I made that bitch famous over and over. When he released a music video for this song, it featured a naked mannequin in bed next to him that really resembled Taylor Swift. As you can imagine, this whole situation caused a lot of backlash for him, understandably. And obviously she was upset about it. Again, understandably. 
And there was a lot of back and forth saying Kanye cleared it with Taylor before the whole situation and she was okay with it, which she would dispute later on. Aside from the situation being totally unhinged, you may be wondering, what does this even have to do with Taylor's version of her albums? Hold on, because now we are introducing the common denominator, Scooter Braun, who was Kanye West's manager at the time. You may know this name because Scooter Braun also manages famous musicians like Justin Bieber and Ariana Grande. But at the time, Taylor would also accuse Scooter Braun of bullying her online with Justin Bieber and Kanye West, which Justin Bieber would later apologize for this. But fast forward to 2019, Scooter Braun purchases Big Machine Records. Yep, the company Taylor has a record deal with that owns all her music through his company Ithaca Holdings, making him the owner of Taylor's first six albums. Imagine how well that went over. And to make matters worse, she revealed later on that she actually found out about this deal when it went public. So she had no prior knowledge that this was taking place before it happened. Insane. And about the situation, she would release the following statement. For years, I asked, pleaded for a chance to own my own work, she said. Instead, I was given an opportunity to sign back up to Big Machine Records and earn one album back at a time. That's so sleazy. One for every new one I turned in. What? <laughs> I walked away because I knew once I signed that contract, Scott Burchetta would sell the label, thereby selling me and my future. I had to make the excruciating choice to leave behind my past, the music I wrote on my bedroom floors and the videos I dreamed up and paid for from the money I earned playing in bars, then clubs, then arenas, then stadiums. Just imagine how devastating that must be. You worked like for years on this dream you had and then someone just like rips it out from under you and says haha I own everything not you that's terrible and she wanted to buy her stuff but they wouldn't let her under like normal circumstances she continues the statement all I could think about was the incessant manipulative bullying I've received at his hands for years she said like when Kim Kardashian orchestrated an illegally recorded snippet of a phone call to be leaked and then Scooter got his two clients together to bully me online about it or when his client Kanye West organized a revenge porn music video which strips my body naked now Scooter has has stripped me of my life's work that I wasn't given an opportunity to buy. Especially my musical legacy is about to lie in the hands of someone who tried to dismantle it. She went on to continue to say how this was the worst case scenario and accused Scott Borchetta of selling the record label to Scooter Braun even though he knew Taylor would oppose it. There were also many disputes of her getting stiffed by them and never receiving like millions of dollars worth of royalties that she should have received, which is also a huge problem. So to make matters worse, she doesn't own her own music. She got totally screwed and she's not receiving the millions of dollars of compensation which she was under contract to receive. So it's like only bad things are happening here. So because Big Machine Records owned the rights to her music, there were a lot of issues with Taylor not being able to play certain songs because of copyright infringement. So basically how that works is under intellectual property laws, there's copyright, there's trademark, all those sort of things. And copyright is what protects a certain like music sound, or a song and then trademark is what protects like the name of the song so because big machine records owned her stuff they could sue her for infringement even though technically it's hers but they own the rights to it so as you can see this is a huge huge issue and why she wanted to own her stuff outright hello <laughs> 
So from August of 2019 to January of 2020, Big Machine Records released about 4,000 vinyl LPs of each single Taylor had put out. Obviously, this was met with a lot of backlash and criticism by her fans. And in April of 2020, a live performance of Taylor from a 2008 radio show, which she didn't authorize, and she just dismissed it as another case of shameless greed in the time of coronavirus. If that wasn't bad enough of a situation, of course, why wouldn't Scooter Braun just stop there? Let things lie. No, no. In October of 2020, he would sell his rights and master recordings to Shamrock Holdings, which was an American private equity company owned by the Disney estate for $405 million. Like, that's just dumb. <laughs> And of course, again, Taylor attempted to negotiate with Scooter, but this is the terms he gave her. Oh, she could buy her music back. Only if she signed an ironclad NDA or non-disclosure agreement saying that she would only say nice things about him and wouldn't actually speak the truth of the situation. Like, he knows he screwed her royally. So this is the only way to like sweep the situation under the rug because he knows the truth is going to come out regardless. And Taylor also claimed that Scooter Braun demanded that Shamrock Holdings not notify her at all until the sale was completed. So if we've learned anything about Scooter Braun up until this point, it's that he is just so greedy and not a nice person at all. Well, it looks like he's the real foolish one in this situation because she's really going to turn things around from this point on. On November 16th, 2020, Taylor upheld her original decision and decided she would be re-recording and re-releasing all of her old albums, which is absolutely genius. She really said, well, I see your cards and I raise you. And she did. <laughs> So Taylor started with her Fearless album, Taylor's version, which she re-recorded and re-released on April 9th, 2021. Then Red Taylor's version was released on November 12th, 2021. And I think Red Taylor's version really broke the world when everyone heard her 10 minute version of All Too Well. Then she released Speak Now, Taylor's version on July 7th, 2023. And if you're watching this video on the day it was released, that means Taylor's version of 1989 comes out today on October 27th. This leaves two of her older albums, Reputation and her debut album, Taylor Swift. Now, I think she's going to do Reputation then Taylor Swift because that would just be such a cute way to like end the Taylor's version era starting where she began. And you know Taylor Swift is known for leaving little Easter eggs and really planning out absolutely everything. So I kind of think this is what she's gonna do. And then along with her re-recordings of each album, she's also releasing songs in each album that are from the vault. Now, this is genius. I heard her say that these from the vault songs are songs that she had written for that particular album, but they never made the cut and it didn't feel right to put them on another album because they belonged in that era. So now she's not only reclaiming the rights to her original music, but she's also releasing new music with every album, which further makes it her own. And of course, she released albums later than 2018 with a different record label, which includes her Lover album from 2019, Folklore from 2020, Evermore from 2020, and Midnight's from 2022. And these albums were recorded under Republic Records and Universal Music Group. So you may still be confused on what Taylor's version means. Basically, when you see Taylor's version, it means that is the same song, but Taylor owns the rights to that music. And of course, her fans have really accepted this and she has found great success in re-releasing all of these new albums. And she is one of the most successful female artists of 
the decade. Now, everything happens for a reason because she ended up going on the Eros tour. Now, you may be wondering, how does copyright even apply to this situation? And can she get sued for infringement if Big Machine Records still owns the original recordings? Now, I'm no lawyer, so this is just my understanding of this case, but both copyright and trademark apply in this situation. Taylor Swift holds trademarks on her name, her signature, her initials, the names of her album, her fan club, song titles, lyrics, names of her tours, names of her music festivals, all of her Taylor's version albums, and all of her new albums. The name Taylor Swift is eligible for trademark because it is the name of her brand. And then copyright protects creative works like music. And again, I am no lawyer. This is just my understanding of things. But because she re-recorded all the songs and then added Taylor's version to each title of the song, cannot be sued for infringement because the songs are different now because she re-recorded them. Her voice is more mature. She's older. The song titles are different because now they say like fearless taylor's version so technically it's a different song and it's changed enough from the original it's seen as not the same thing anymore this is absolutely genius it is mind-blowing to me like the fact that she's using her songs that everyone already loves but re-recording them and re-releasing them in a way that she gets the benefits of which she deserves since she put in the work to write the songs and record the songs and have everyone love the songs it's genius and this is absolutely the best way for her to reclaim the rights of her own music. This whole situation has 100% absolutely revolutionized the music industry and really stressed the importance of intellectual property rights because I feel like in the past, a lot of artists found themselves in situations where they kind of got screwed by record labels. This case absolutely stresses the importance of owning your own work and protecting your intellectual property and stresses how valuable an artist's intellectual property really is and the importance of reading every contract so carefully before you sign it, especially if it's a long-term life-altering contract, which are all things that the music industry really doesn't talk about, but they're starting to talk about now.